Hello everyone, this is Rick, and welcome to Astral Club. Today, we are going to review the CIA's secret astral visits to Mars and Jupiter. When I was a kid, I was very much interested in astronomy. I had a telescope and I had a, uh, uh, a poster with our solar system on my wall and it had all the different uh, facts about the planets and how much you would weigh on each of the planets. And I remember, geez, that'd be really big there on Jupiter. And, uh, and I was always fascinated with, with Mars. And I recall in the 70s, uh, the Viking 1 lander was going to be landing on Mars, and there was a lot of excitement about it. And so uh, before the Viking 1 lander landed, in 76, I decided to, to visit Mars myself. And there I reported in my journal seeing a blue twilight as the sun set, which surprised me because I didn't think that was right. Everybody knew Mars was red, for instance. Of course, today we know that Martian sunsets appear bluish to humans because the fine dust uh, that... Um, near the sun's part of the sky is more prominent and it's bluish in color. Whereas the, uh, the normal daylight makes the red planet its typical rusty red color. So that observation I made back in 75 turned out to be right. Uh, and that always gave me some, uh, some uh, felt better about the whole experience because I doubted it when I came back with that whole bluish sky during sunset thing. Um, and, um, but today we're gonna to be talking about these released, um, uh, they used to be secret, but now they've been released to the CIA website. And I'll give you the links should you wanna peruse the whole things yourself. And uh, these reports detail an astral visit that um, uh, occurred. The first one was uh, the Mars exploration, dated May 22nd, 1984. And then there was one in April 1973, uh, where um, Harold Sherman and Ingo Swan visited the planet Jupiter uh, during astral projection. So that's what we're going to cover today. And I'm kind of excited about that. Let's start with the Mars visit. Now the way it was set up for this particular test, there was a sealed envelope that had geographic coordinates. And this envelope was given to the subject. We don't have names here. So uh, all I can say is it was given to a subject immediately prior to this particular interview experience. The envelope was not opened until after the experiment. And inside the envelope was a three by five card with the following information. The planet Mars, time of interest approximately one million years BC. So that's interesting. Um, you have the sealed envelope with these instructions to go to Mars and tell us what it was like one million years ago. And um, that's how the whole thing starts. So once again, here you have um, a monitor and a subject. So uh, I don't have names. Uh, well, what I'll do is I'll kind of go through the transcript of this experience. And we, I think you'll see there's a couple surprising things in here that, uh, that might be of interest to us. Um, okay. The, uh, the monitor says, all right, now, uh, using the information that's in this sealed envelope, uh, I want you to focus your attention, and then he gives particular coordinates. The subject then begins after a short delay. Um, he wants to say it looks like, uh, he doesn't know, some kind of oblique view of a pyramid or a pyramid form. It's very high. It's kind of sitting in a large, depressed area. Um, the subject then says it's yellowish, kind of okra colored. The monitor then says, well, move in time 
to the, the time indicated in the envelope and then describe what's happening. Uh, so the subject then says, okay, I'm tracking severe, severe clouds, more like a dust storm. It's some kind of geologic problem. Um, and he gets very confused. The monitor just says, just report your raw perceptions. Uh, it's still early in the session. So the subject says, look, I'm looking at a major geologic problem. And then he, the monitor says, okay, go back to a time before this geologic problem. And then the subject says, oh, it's a total difference. Um, let's see here. There's mountains of dirt. They appear and then they disappear. Uh, I guess he's probably traveling through time here. Um, he sees flat surfaces, and then he sees a megalith. Uh, at this period in time, there's geologic activity. He looks around, and he's trying to find the source of this activity. And then he's seeing a perception of shadow people. They're very tall and thin, but they're only shadows. It's as if they were there, and they're not anymore. So I think what he's seeing here is probably the astral shadows of these inhabitants of Mars going back before a million years. So the monitor says, well, go back to a period of time when they were there, you know, in the physical. So um, he, um, he attempts to do that. He says he gets a lot of static. Uh, there's a lot of what he calls breaking up along fragmentary pieces of time. I'm not sure exactly what that means. And then the monitor says, look, just report the raw data. <laughs> he says, I just keep seeing very large people. They appear thin and tall, but they're very large and they're wearing some kind of strange clothes. Monitor says, all right, now holding to this time period, uh, he then gives them coordinates to another space on the planet Mars. So uh, this the subject, I guess, moves there. Now he says, I'm deep inside of a cavern, but it's not a cavern, more like a canyon. He says, I'm looking up the sides and there's a steep wall that seems to go on forever. And then there's um, something like a structure that's been carved. Um, again, he's getting very large structures with um, intri intricacies uh, in the uh, smooth stone carved. Um, and the monitor says, do the structures have insides and outsides? Subject says, yes, they're very like a rabbit warren. Corners of rooms, they're really huge. I don't feel like I'm standing in one, it's just really huge. And the perception is that the ceiling is very high and the walls are very wide. Now, 22 minutes goes by. And I guess he's just kind of in interior exploring. Um, then he says, there appears to be the end of a very large road and there's a marker thing that's very large. It keep, he keeps getting like a Washington monument type overlay. So it's, it's, it's an obelisk, um, that I, that I guess reminded him of the Washington monument, which by the way is an obelisk and it is patterned on, uh, on Egyptian monolisks. Uh, going back to ancient Egypt. So the monitor gives him, you know, more and more instructions. He says, I'm in the middle of a huge circular basin and there's a range of mountains. Um, everything's very big. Um, and um, so, the, so the guy just kind of says, well, kind of concentrate. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, he says he sees a radiating pattern of some sort. It's like some strange intersection kind of roads that are dug into the valleys, you know, where a road is just a little below the edge. Uh, he says, tell me about the shape of these things. He says, they're like real neat channels cut. They're very deep. It's like the road went down. Um, he gives him, the, the monitor gives him yet some more instructions as to where he should go. Now he sees an intersection. He sees aqueduct type things with rounded bottom carved channels like road beds. Um, let's see, they're in the horizon. He sees something funny that looks misty. 
Then he sees pyramids. He uh, and he says that they are huge. Um, uh, let's see here. Once again, now he's experiencing dust storms or something. He says, and then he says the people are sheltering in these pyramids from the storms. And uh, apparently these pyramids are designed as shelters for these storms. There's different chambers, but they're almost stripped of any kind of furnishings or anything. It's like it's a strictly functional place for sleeping and, or he, he corrects himself, he says hibernations. Some form he can't quite uh, explain, but apparently there's these raw, severe storms happening, savage storms, and that these people are sleeping or hibernating through these large storms. Uh, he describes them again. He sees them asleep. He says they're very tall, very large uh, people, but they're thin. They look thin because of their height, and they dress in, he has trouble describing it, like real light silk but it's not flowing type of clothing. It's like it's cut to fit. The monitor says, well, move closer to one of them and, and ask them to tell you about themselves. Apparently they're ancient people. They're, they're dying. It's past their time, it's past their age. Monitor says, tell me about it. Subject says, they're very philosophical about it. They're, they're trying to figure out how to survive, but they just feel they're, they're not going to survive because of all these climactic changes that are occurring on their planet, the planet Mars. Um, let's see here. Uh, evidently though, there is a hope for their race. Apparently, a group or a party of them went to find a new place to live. And apparently they feel it, it, that their world's crumbling uh, among them because of some sort of corruption of their environment. Their environment's failing very rapidly. And, and apparently this group was set out to try to find another place to live. Now I think to myself, if you're in Mars a million or more years ago, and you're gonna send out a party of people to find somewhere else to live in our solar system, for instance, where are you going to go? First of all, Earth is generally the closest place to go. And as far as three-dimensional life, um, I mean, it's bound to be a little different from, from Mars. But I have to believe that three-dimensional life would have a heck of an easier time surviving on Earth than it would any other planet that we currently know about in our solar system. And if this would have happened a million years ago, a million years ago is a very interesting period of time in Earth's history. Now, there's some disagreement about this, but apparently many historians and many archaeologists and many uh, you know, people whose business it is to study these things believe that fire was finally mastered and controlled about a million years ago. And it just kind of came out of nowhere. It was a technological leap, if you will. Um, so wouldn't it be interesting if that was somehow related to the arrival of these beings? And it doesn't say how big the party was, but, you know, it could have been a hundred people. It could have been a thousand. It could have been a few thousand. We know from a genetic standpoint, if you want a viable culture of any sort, you need to send a few thousand folks out and then you need to really control how they breed so that you don't end up with all kinds of recessives causing problems. But if you have space flight capability and the time and it's necessary resource wise, it's possible to do that. Heck, if Mars was livable, we could do that. But um, so anyway, that was one of the very interesting things that was reported um, and uh, so let's, let's go on from there. The monitor says, what was the cause of the atmospheric disturbance or the environmental disturbance? And the subject says, I see a picture, a picture of like, oh heck, 
Um, it's difficult. And I guess the guy says, well, just give me the raw data. He goes, I see a globe. Oh, it's like a globe that goes through a comet's tail or something, a river of something, but it's all very cosmic. It's like space pictures. Um, now, what I think he might be describing here is Mars cooled off millions of years before the Earth. Um, it became inhabitable millions of years before the Earth because it was smaller, it was further away from the sun, and water, liquid water was there, and Mars was habitable millions of years before the Earth was. We're pretty sure of that particular fact. But what happened with Mars is that its core, we believe, is cold. It, so when that happened, when it became cold, it stopped being molten, the geomagnetic protective field that surrounds the Earth, that protects us largely from solar storms, for instance, when you see when you see the polar lights, um, that those are really the side effects of a solar storm that is hitting the Earth. But our magnetic field is fending it off. Now, without that magnetic field over a very long period of time, those solar storms could leach away Earth's environment and. What may have happened and what he may be describing here is over a long period of time, Mars uh, lost its atmosphere and it was being plagued by these huge disturbances, geologic disturbances and storms. And that perhaps this is what these people were experiencing, this civilization, if you will, that, that was living on Mars, who knows how long ago, uh, and uh, that they had to send some sort of party away to find somewhere else to live. My theory is Earth, because I don't know where else they would have went, um, but that's just my theory. At any rate, the monitor says, okay, now, um, before you leave, ask this individual who you're talking to. Now, I know how this works. I've done this before myself. When you were able to speak with or communicate with um, an, an individual. Many times what you're doing is you're, you're talking to them on some sort of a sub-level, perhaps almost in a dream state. And since he, he may even be talking with this individual who's in a hiber hibernation state, when you do that, it, they experience it like it's some sort of a dream. So you're getting information, but these people aren't really conscious. They're, they're looking at you like you're a ghost, okay? Like you're the dream. But you can't get information that way. Anyway, the monitor says, could, could you get a sense of, of any way that you could help him in his present predicament? Uh, the subject says, all I get is that they must just wait. He doesn't know who I am. He thinks I'm an hallucination or something. Okay, then, um, these people are waiting when the others left, how did they go? Well, I get an impression of, oh, he says, I don't know what the hell this thing is. It looks like the inside of a larger boat, very rounded walls and shiny metal. Go along with them on their journey and find out where it is they go. Well, he says, I get an impression of a really crazy place with volcanoes and gas pockets and strange plants a very volatile place. It's very much like going from the frying pan into the fire. The difference is there seems to be a lot of vegetation where the other place did not have it and different kinds of storms. So I don't know, maybe they didn't go to earth. I don't know, I guess maybe I'm just thinking that that's where I would have went in that situation. Um, who knows? Um, it, it's always tough to, to do these things when you're in the astral to know exactly where the heck you are when all you have is just reporting what's around you. Okay, then the monitor says, all right, it's time to come back now to the sound of my voice and return um, to the 22nd of May, 1984 and the sound of my voice and he brings him back to the present. So that was the CIA's um, 
trip to Mars. And uh, as I said, this took place back in 1984, and it's now declassified. So that was a very um, interesting trip there. Why don't we go on to um, the Jupiter exploration and uh, find out what uh, was observed there? This Jupiter experiment was performed by two people. There was Harold Sherman, who I'm very familiar with. He was a psychic researcher. I read a lot of his books when I was a kid in the 70s. One of them was You Live After Death, but he was very prolific. He wrote a lot of books, and it was great. They were paperbacks, so I could afford them. Uh, and it, it, I just, it, he just had this... He was just this open-minded psychic researcher, and I really enjoyed his books. And then there's Ingo Swan, who um, people might be familiar with. He was involved with uh, the CIA's and the Stargate program, um, so which is a, a video that we talked about a few, um, well, a number of months back. Um, now, this particular experiment was interesting. They used both Harold Sherman and Ingo Swan, they set them up in two different places. Um, Harold Sherman of Mountain View, Arkansas, and Ingo Swan of New York, New York, they uh, were both given envelopes with the target of Jupiter, but they were in two different um, places, two different laboratories uh, separated by... Um, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of miles. And these experiences, their reports of what they saw when directed to this um, planet Jupiter uh, lines up very well. And as I said, the time, the, the time was corrected for. So both of these individuals were making these reports of their astral impression of the planet Jupiter at the same time, despite being very far from one another. Um, now, uh, the uh, NASA Galileo spacecraft uh, ended up confirming uh, something that, that will be reported when I go over this. And uh, this is something that scientists didn't know at the time. They both reported ammonia ice crystals, which were in the northwest corner of the Great Red Spot. Um, scientists at that point in time did not know about that. And, and they didn't know about it for sure until the Galileo spacecraft cruised by um, Jupiter years later uh, and, and reported these ammonia ice crystals did indeed exist. Now, this research took part on April 27th, 1973. Uh, and as I said, you had Harold Sherman and Ingle Swan at two different places. Um, I guess Mr. Sherman was on Central Standard Time and Mr. Swan was on West Coast Time. So they were certainly very far apart. And as I said, they took place simultaneously. And so the actual CIA report shows um, what they were talking about at the same time. And I think you'll find this very interesting because they're very similar. So first of all, you have Sherman, and his first impressions were, okay, gases, giving off a golden glow and crystal-like diamond sparkles. Swan says, they're crystals, they glitter. Maybe the stripes are like bands of crystals. Sherman says, it gives off a golden glow. Swan said, distinctly yellow. Um, Sherman said, it's a gaseous area of myriad colors, yellow, red, ultraviolet, some greens, like a giant fireworks display. Uh, Swan says, inside these cloud layers, they look beautiful from the outside. From the inside, they look like roiling gas clouds, eerie yellow light, rainbows. Uh, uh, Sherman says, enormous cloud cover, must be miles and miles deep. Uh, Swan says, then I came through cloud cover, and the atmosphere of Jupiter is very thick. Um, then they go to what's considered the surface. And there is a surface, sort of, to Jupiter, because as these gases 
uh, go under pressures and pressures and unbelievable pressures that we can't even really conceive of. Even gases become somewhat solid and take on very unique properties. Anyway, um, Sherman says, I see on the surface a reddish brown formation extending in a curved line as far as my mind's eye can see. There appears to be huge volcanic peaks, great cones rising for miles. It's almost metallic, molten, and sparks red hot. Swan says, the horizon looks orangish or rose-colored. The whole thing seems enormously flat. There is an enormous mountain range about 31,000 feet high. These mountains are huge. The surface of Jupiter would give a high infrared count. Okay, other surface characteristics of Jupiter. And this is where Sherman says, ice crystals. I am wondering if they are not icy cold. At that same time, Swan says, bands of crystals, kind of bluish. It's colder here. Sherman says, swirling vortices of increasing velocity, powerful magnetic forces, winds of terrific velocity. There must be water. Swan says, I see something that looks like a tornado. It seems to be stuck, not moving. Tremendous winds. I feel like there's liquid here, a liquid like water. Uh, and Sherman finishes with, the atmosphere seems unusually dense on some levels and extremely rarefied on others. And Swan says, in the atmosphere are crystals. They'll reflect radio probes and another layer further down like our clouds. So this was their simultaneous impression of the planet Jupiter. And as I said, when the Galileo spacecraft arrived uh, much later, uh, and it went by Jupiter, it was able to confirm that in the northwest corner of the Great Red Spot, which is described, by the way, as a giant storm that is captive. It's like held in place by these tremendous pressures for long periods of time. So what you've got there is this huge lightning storm in a bottle. <laughs> so these were their simultaneous impressions. Now, both of these reports were labeled secret for years, and they are now available on the CIA's website. And I will provide the, the links uh, in the description to the CIA web reports, and uh, you can read the whole things there. And uh, I think it's, it's very interesting to see what was happening in the 70s and the 80s and, and that the, uh, the CIA was interested enough to make reports of these explorations and classify them secret. And, and luckily now at this point in time, they're just releasing these things online and they're freely available for anyone who wants to check them out. Well, I want to thank everyone. The um, subscriptions are continuing to grow. If you liked this video, please hit the like button, share it with those of like minds. Subscribe if you haven't already. If you have subscribed, why don't you hit that bell button so you'll always be reminded when I post new content. And if you have a comment, I'd be glad to uh, read them and share them with our community. And as always, I'm Rick, and I will see you on the Astral Plane.